Hello everyone, my name is Adam Kozłowski uh, and I'm here to present you your own Kubernetes castle. This is a presentation which tackles a very important topic of building production ready Kubernetes clusters using the open source components. So shortly about me, uh, my name is Adam Kozłowski. I work for GrapeUp uh, now over five years uh, on a position of technical leader and cloud solution architect. And I help big enterprises with their Kubernetes adoption and promoting their clusters to production. So let's think about the topic I put there. Why a castle? So I imagine that the production cluster is very similar in properties with medieval castle. And why is that? I think they shared the common requirements uh, when someone was building a castle, it was built for years. It wasn't just a temporary project, which was meant to uh, work only a few weeks or a few months and then be destroyed. Uh, it's a solution that has to be reliable and resilient and work for years. And this is also an important topic for the production clusters. Uh, it, it shouldn't be built with a few weeks in mind because in general, this is not how production works. Um, so it cannot be temporary solution. The other important topic uh, when we think about the castle is that it has to be secure. For example, it can be built on uh, a mountain. And this also applies to, to Kubernetes clusters. The cluster has to be secure when it's production. Um, it depends if the cluster is development. The development doesn't have to be as secure as production. But production cluster, uh, I think that security is one of, or maybe the most important uh, topics when thinking about that. The other thing is that there should be a supporting infrastructure, both for a medieval castle, when you need to a clean water supply or blacksmith of carpenter services. And the same thing, maybe not same explicitly, but the similar thing for the Kubernetes clusters. The Kubernetes is just an orchestrator. It's a tool which has a specific use case for orchestrating your workloads, orchestrating your containers. Uh, to make it production ready, and production viable, you need to install the supporting components which help with the topics that are not handled uh, directly by the Kubernetes, like storing and displaying logs, storing and displaying metrics, or for example, just the automation for CI CD. And the last topic, uh, which is rather important and also shared between the Castle uh, and Kubernetes cl production cluster is that accents, uh, the access to the castle de depended uh, in the medieval era uh, on your role in the society. So king have a different access, knight has different access, and the blacksmith has a different access to the inside of the castle. And the same thing is uh, for the Kubernetes cluster. Your user and the group you're in uh, is the dependency uh, which says what you can do in the cluster. So if you uh, if you are an admin, you can create any kind of resources, like you can, can do anything in the castle. But if you are just a developer, maybe you, you are not able to configure, for example, ingresses or storage classes. So it really depends on your group or your role. So that's first part of the topic, but there is also a second part. Uh, why the open source and why the open source components? So the open source uh, is a rather broad term. It may refer to the distribution model, to the license, or just the open source movement. And to, to describe why uh, open source, I will use the definition, which is uh, the open source model is decentralized uh, and focused on open collaboration, because this is why I picked the open source. Um, when you use the open source components, uh, it's based on the open collaboration. Anyone can make a change. Anyone can propose the change, um, uh, create a pull request. Not all of the pull requests are accepted, but this is not just the end of the world. You always can create a fork, uh, either for your own use or share it with the community and use that so solution uh, in your product. So it's not closed source. You can uh, anytime make any change. 
and uh, just alter it for your needs. Um, there is a community collaboration. Uh, people are trying to solve the issues. It's not just a single person trying to, to make it all work. Um, there are even companies sharing uh, the, the source code and helping with uh, the development of open source tools. And the affordable pricing, uh, it sounds a little bit funny because in most cases we think about the open source as a free tool. And in most cases it is free, uh, but it's also important to consider that the open source does not explicitly mean it's free. It only means it's publicly available. So if it's free in your use scenario for your needs, uh, it's better to check the license. There are different licenses and most of them in general uh, are very permissive. But if you think about changing the code, uh, you need to make sure that the, the license that does not, for example, require you to publish it. It sometimes does uh, require to publish your changes. So what are the bricks, the last part of the topic? Um, I would divide them into two main aspects, the tools and the configuration. Uh, in this presentation, we'll focus on the tools, um, which are also multiple topics like observability, automation, or security. But the important part, which is not part of the present in this presentation, is the configuration, uh, like role-based access control configuration in your cluster, uh, kubelet fine-tuning, authentication authorization, like implementing uh, OpenID or LDAP to access the cluster itself, and making sure the underlying infrastructure is resilient, safe, and backed up. Um, this is very important. And to make sure the solution is really production ready, you need to combine both the, the good tools, good components, and the great configuration. So in this presentation, I will show you a multiple different open source tools and components, which uh, I would recommend for using in your Kubernetes production environments. Um, but how did I select them? So all of them, uh, were tested by Graypub and by me in our projects, and they are proven to work great in the production clusters. They are all open source licensed um, and have active community support. Uh, this is very important uh, because you can always find an open source tool which is uh, working, but the last commit was like a year ago, and the last answer for, for the a case uh, or a bug is three months old. So that's not really useful. Uh, the active community support is really important for, for this kind of tools that if there is uh, a security issue, uh, even if uh, you can fix it, uh, someone has to accept the pull request, right? Um, and the other important thing is that all of them are part on the, of the CNCF, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation landscape. So you can always find them there and check uh, how they compare with the other tools which are not uh, present on this presentation. Okay, so let's start with the first topic, observability. Uh, and what I mean by observability. So observability uh, is an ability to make sure what happens inside your cluster. So. The, the core components for that, uh, we, which we will go through later, are logs, metrics, and the network, which is, which is observable through the service mesh, for, for example. So th those are three important aspects of observability. And why do you need observability? Obviously, you need to always know what happens in your cluster when it's in production. You need to make sure that uh, it's operating correctly. You need to make sure you're getting alerts when something might get wrong in the nearby future or just happened wrong uh, uh, a moment ago. So the first one will be logs. And for logs, I put uh, or selected two components, two uh, systems. One is Elk, which is Elasticsearch Log Station Kibana. And the name may be also, uh, the, the often used name is also EFK, uh, which is Elasticsearch Fluent Kibana. 
and this is a widely used tool um very common very popular uh very capable of handling extremely large amounts of logs and and uh, storage but also a quite complicated with the configuration especially if the configuration has to be uh ha uh, so highly available and you, you store a lot of logs um it might be rather complicated to configure elk if you have no experience the huge advantage of it is the query language which provides an ability for the full text search uh, which is uh, not that common this is something uh, which uh, elk is great with and uh, this makes searching logs much easier than uh, some of the other tools um, the disadvantage of the elk itself maybe it's not that huge disadvantage it's just the uh, small limitation that uh, the security is not part of the open source part uh, but there is a workaround for that, which is called the Open Distro. Uh, it was created, I think, by Amazon. And this is a version which uh, extends the, the basic ELK tool set with the security and other important tools which are not present uh, in the basic installation. So if you need the security part, multi-tenancy, uh, you can use the Open Distro for that. But sometimes, even for the production cluster, the elk stack is too big or too complicated to configure. And for that situation, you have Grafana Loki. It has much lower the resource uh, footprint than elk. And it shares the UI with the Grafana. Uh, Grafana is used for the metrics. It's very easy to install too. Um, the disadvantage of it is it's much simpler. It doesn't have the visualization that Kibana has for, for the metrics. And the query language is very similar to the Prometheus query language. And this means it's limited. It's not the full text search. Um, it's just, it's more like regex. So it is uh, limited in this, uh, in this case. And it might be harder to find the log you're looking for. Uh, but both are great. It just depends on your uh, on your needs. Next topic, metrics. And for that, actually, I just picked one solution because it's so popular and so widespread um, that I think it's something I could recommend easily. And this is the set of Grafana, Prometheus, and Alert Manager. And most of the installers, for example, the Prometheus operator installs uh, the full set at once because uh, all of them depend on each other. The Prometheus is a tool which uh, gathers and stores the metrics. Um, so this is like a pull or push model depending on the configuration. And the metrics are stored in the TSDB, uh, which is a database uh, holding the metrics sorted by a timestamp, so time series DB. And to, to see the metrics, to, see the dashboards and display them uh, for the user. There is a Grafana, which is a very nice tool, highly configurable for creating a dashboards and uh, it reads directly from Prometheus. So it doesn't really require a lot of uh, storage and a lot of database. Um, it just stores the dashboards and all the metrics data is held in most cases. It depends on your caching strategy too. But the, in most cases, the data is uh, pulled directly from Prometheus. And for the metrics, uh, the metrics are also a base for alerts. And there is a tool um, which is called Alert Manager, which is also part of this tool set. And this tool uh, is uh, able to alert and notify you about the problems or alarms uh, created based on the metrics, uh, either the metrics coming right now or the historical ones. And you can, for example, create an alert when the CPU usage is slow. Uh, is, is too high. Um, the amount of storage available is getting low. And for example, if the uh, bandwidth is getting low uh, for some specific services. So it's highly configurable. Uh, you can use any metrics you want and very complicated uh, mathematical formulas if it's required for calculating a specific uh, alert. Uh, alert. 
And as a toolset, it's really great, uh, especially for the start when you need to monitor your cluster, because if you use the Prometheus operator installer, but it's not just limited to that, uh, you can easily install it using a, a single CRD, but the CRD is not just for installing the Prometheus Grafana and Alert Manager, but also uh, it is able to um, read or you are able to use the CRD to create uh, alerts and dashboards dynamically, which is great. And you can even allow users to add them, their own dashboards to their tools. And most of the tools uh, which are on this presentation and most of the open source tools from the CNCF landscape already have uh, the examples or existing uh, Grafana dashboards, which is also great. So, so the support for Prometheus and Grafana is very often built in. And sometimes uh, you need to scale up the metrics uh, system. And there are also open source two solutions, Cortex and Thanos. Uh, they're very similar. Um, the difference is that the Cortex was designed for scalability, uh, while Thanos was designed with a small footprint in mind. So the, how Cortex works, it's a centralized system while the Thanos uh, is deployed as a sidecar. Uh, so for the Thanos, there are more Prometheus instances, but smaller ones. Cortex is a single big one. And uh, the this is also different from the query perspective and the storage perspective, because Thanos has to query all the Prometheuses and then gather the results, which uh, it has a great, um, great code for, for making queries the, and the uh, fan out system, which makes it very, very fast. Uh, when the Cortex has a centralized storage, so the metrics, all metrics are sent to the single storage. So this is, for example, easier to backup. So those are two different tools uh, when you need to scale up your metric system. And the other thing you might need for observability is the service mesh. A service mesh is a dedicated layer for making service to service calls or container to container calls. And the idea is to uh, solve the challenges of the developers when they need to call remote endpoints or the, the endpoints inside the cluster, like making the secure by default or adding the service discovery. But also a service mesh is a set of a proxies, uh, which abstract the network inside the cluster. Uh, and because all the traffic goes through this, those proxies, uh, there is very often observability built in, uh, which makes it easier to uh, gather metrics about the bandwidth, bandwidth being used, amount of connections failing or being successful. Um, so that's a very important topic too. And for uh, this topic, I picked two solutions. Um, they are very, very similar. And there are not that many differences. Uh, the Istio is very popular. I think it's the most popular service mesh right now. And it has a lot of examples and code snippets and a, a lot of stuff already built in, especially in terms of documentation and the articles. And it has a multi-cluster support, but compared to Linkerd, it's slightly less performant than uh, Istio, uh, that it's slightly less performant than Linkerd uh, when the, the traffic uh, is high. So there are high loads and uh, large amounts of data being transferred. The Linkerd was built with performance in mind. It doesn't have multi-cluster support. Uh, and uh, some of the features of Istio like circuit breaking are missing but the resource footprint is uh, very small and it makes it uh, much faster if there is uh, a large amount of data to be transferred. So the next topic is automation or continuous integration delivery. And each cloud native solution, each production cluster um, has to consider this, this aspect of deploying and developing applications. So um, making sure the builds are reputable and observable and also proper version control. And 
for production clusters mainly, the application delivery system, which is also reliable. So let's start with the rather complicated topic, which is a GitOps. And why GitOps is complicated? Um, it is complicated because it tries to solve a very important aspect of uh, the development. So it, it's trying to solve the, the problem that developer has to be able to deploy their applications automatically uh, from the development to production. And the problem with that is um, there has to be a single source of truth, like for example, the Git repository, which holds all the configuration and then it's pulled for, uh, for changes by the Argo CD or with Flex in this case. And if the state of the cluster differs uh, from the repository, it has to be updated. So in theory, this is rather uh, easy concept, but there are caveats that uh, uh, are very hard to solve. Like for example, the secrets. The secrets are not really safe in Kubernetes if you store them uh, as a secret because they are not encrypted by default. Um, so the GitOps uh, has to read the, the secrets somewhere and you shouldn't put them obviously in Git repository. So this is the part of configuration that is very often uh, challenging. And uh, the uh, configuration uh, otherwise is rather simple. Uh, and why I picked those tools? I've tested both, both of them and they're all they're both nice. Uh, and there are also small differences between Argo and Flux. Um, the Argo has a very nice UI, so it's e easier just to look at it and see how it behaves. And it has a great multi-cluster support. So uh, for each project, each component you configure in there, you can set the target cluster. Um, so there can be multiple targets so, so the Argo technically supports the, the multi-cluster design, while the Flux uh, is uh, able to only read one remote repository and one target cluster. So that's a limitation, uh, not a big one, because in most cases uh, you can live with just having one with Flux in, the, uh, in your cluster. And also, uh, it's not, it doesn't have an UI, but it has a nice CLI for management. Um, both of the tools are only continuous delivery GitOps tools, so there is no continuous integration. And the continuous integration will be the next part. So for the continuous integration, uh, I picked two tools. It's Jenkins and the Concourse. Um, and both of them are great. Um, the Jenkins is widely used. Uh, it has a huge adoption. I think almost every company or every developer uh, ha have used the Jenkins at some point of their, uh, of their journey. And it has tons of plugins available. So you can install almost everything uh, as a plugin. But it's also uh, a little bit monolithic. It's harder to install and configure than, than the other tools. And the uh, configuration as a code is a little bit strange compared, for example, to the concourse because it's partially configured through UI and partially through the code. The lightweight alternative to Jenkins is the already mentioned concourse. The concourse is very easy to install and it has a very great um, system of pipelines which are uh, deployed through CLI, the fly, and are written in YAML. So the, the UI is very clear uh, all pipelines are described in YAML, so that there is literally no way to change the configuration through the uh, user interface. Uh, and it has a very nice uh, way of, uh, it was designed in a way that the workers are very lightweight and fully isolated. So each worker in the concourse runs in the container, which is fully isolated. Um, in Jenkins, it is also possible, but it, this is not how it was designed uh, initially. So it requires some more, a little bit more sophisticated configuration. The next important uh, topic for your cluster is the ingress controller. And 
what is ingress controller? Let's start with that. Uh, ingress controller is a combination of load balancer and the proxy, which is responsible for reading the Kubernetes ingress resource or object. And based on those objects, it routes the traffic, incoming traffic uh, for your cluster to a specific service or set of, or set of services. And for this, I picked three, uh, three possible uh, ingress controllers. There are much more of them. There is, and there are literally, I think it's 12 or something like that. There are a lot of ingress controllers. Uh, I'm not saying those three are the best. Those three are the ones uh, I have tested. So the first one and uh, the, the one which uh, is part of the official Kubernetes documentation is the Kubernetes ingress controller or Nginx ingress controller because it's based on Nginx. And this is a small disadvantage of this tool because um, there are two ingress controllers. One is Kubernetes ingress controller and one is Nginx ingress controller. And um, even though the Kubernetes ingress controller is based on Nginx, this is not the same thing. So uh, if, if you go through the uh, web pages and try to figure out uh, what's the difference and uh, which one is which, it's slightly more, um, more complicated than it seems initially. Uh, but it, both of them have uh, great advantages. So a lot of people know Nginx. It works great and it has nice uh, configuration. Uh, it requires some knowledge to write the Nginx configuration correctly. But if you have this knowledge, uh, you, you can configure almost everything. And some, or maybe let's say a lot of uh, these configuration options are available in the ingress object as annotations. So you, you can use take advantage of uh, most of the configuration on, or configurability of Nginx just using the annotations on the ingress objects, which is very great. Um, the difference between the Kubernetes ingress controller and the Nginx ingress controller uh, is not big. Um, the Nginx one provides uh, the query parameter support uh, as the extension of just route and path. And the Kubernetes one has uh, additionally the authentication part, like basic authentication can be configured using the, uh, the Kubernetes ingress controller. And the two alternatives I picked, uh, the traffic, which has now version two and HA proxy. And the traffic advantage is it, it has a very nice user interface. So um, if you need to quickly look at what's wrong, what's going on in, in, in the ingress controller, the traffic is great for that. Uh, you have an e e easy to use user interface. You cannot make any configuration changes for, from there, which is also rather good because you can uh, allow access to, to this UI for, for the developers. And it's really easy to install. Um, the disadvantages of this one, so when it was switched from version one to version two, is it lost support for some of the features. Uh, I think they might just add them later on uh, in the in the uh, in the development, and it supports the native uh, resources, the native ingress resource, but it also uses its own CRDs, um, which is slightly confusing when you just start from there. And the HA proxy alternative, um, I put it here because it's very performant compared to any other ingress controller. It, from some of the tests and some of the uh, comparisons, it may be even the, the most performant load balancer. Uh, it has a lot of configuration. You can con configure a lot of things, but it doesn't have a user interface. And the configuration may be slightly harder than the Kubernetes and traffic ones because there is less uh, less resources available for that. But if you need the re really performant ingress controller, the, the HA proxy may be, may be your choice. So the security. Um, the security in the cluster is a very important topic. And as I said uh, previously uh, in, the, in this presentation, 
the configuration part of the cluster, uh, like making sure only authorized users are able to access it. Uh, and the uh, role-based access control, airbag, for making sure only specified people can make uh, specific changes are very important. Um, but you're not really limited to those uh, two or three aspects of the Kubernetes security. There are tools that can be installed that help you with, with making sure that cluster is secure. Um, so first important topic is OpenID or OIDC, OpenID Connect Provider. And those providers um, are just identity layer for verifying end users uh, authentication by using external authorization provider or third party. And both of them are very easy to use. And it's just nice to have the OpenID or OIDC provider inside your cluster um, because you can easily change the third party which is used for authorization and verifying the identity of the user. So that's great. And here I picked two of them. And uh, they're also very similar. Um, the DEX is just a simpler tool than the Keycloak. Uh, it's easy to use, it's simple, it's just the OIDC proxy. So it proxies your uh, authorization the authentication requests uh, to the other, uh, other provider. Uh, but it has a slightly limited capabilities compared to Keycloak. And it's just a proxy. No automation, no custom claims, nothing like that. It just proxies your requests. Um, but if you need more than DEX provides, you can use the key clock, which is very extensible and advanced in configuration, and it has an UI. Um, so that's two nice things to have, but also it allows you to create a custom flows and two-factor authentication. So you, you can configure more more secure system with, with that. And um, this advantage of this solution will be it's harder to configure than DEX and requires uh, additional database for storing all this configuration and the, the, the user claims all the custom, uh, uh, custom profile changes. Uh, so even conceptually, it's just bigger to, to deploy. Uh, just, it's just a bigger solution, has a bigger resource footprint than DEX. And the next, backup and restore. So backup and restore, I, for me personally, it's either the most important topic or the second one uh, in, in the security. Uh, and this is because uh, a lot of people take backup and restore for granted. Um, because a lot of solutions provide this kind of thing. And a, a lot of companies do not test the restore functionality. So as long as the backup works, it's tested once initially, or even not that, and th this is all. And uh, the backup and restore uh, toolkit is probably the most important uh, part of your production ready deployment, because you cannot rely on the fact that what you created is so great, it's uh, it will survive any kind of disaster. Uh, the underlying infrastructure like AWS cloud or, or Azure cloud, uh, it's so resilient, it doesn't fail that often, um, but there is a very small chance that it may fail. And if the underlying infrastructure fails and you have no backup, you have a very you have to have a very great disaster recovery plan to dis, to, to recover from that, and you, you if you have a backup, it's just as easy as restoring the backup. The bigger problem is that how to configure the backup and restore correctly, uh, especially if you're using either on premises Kubernetes deployment, or it's using the uh, not so widely used and supported cloud. Because for example, some of the clouds uh, like EKS, um, they, they use uh, for the persistent volumes, the, the storage, the, the volumes fr from the cloud provider, which are which can be configured to be backed up automatically by the, by the, the, um, by the provider. But then um, you might 
need to copy the data somewhere else in case something happens with that provider. And the Valero is a solution which is in most cases independent on the provider because it has a support for all uh, common clouds like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. Uh, you, you can think of anything like that, but it also has um, a tool built in which is called Trastic, which allows to make an image uh, of the persistent volume, uh, which is not supported directly by the Valero. So if you have a provider like, I don't know, OpenStack, which might be not supported by Valero, you can use Trastic to, to make a backup of, of, of this volume, just a plain backup, bit to bit, but still a backup. Um, and just have a, a working backup and resource strategy like that. Um, the disadvantage is that uh, it doesn't have a user interface. It's probably not the biggest disadvantage in the world. Uh, and the backup metadata is stored uh, without versioning. So sometimes uh, you, may, you may be able to break the mechanism by just removing the file by mistake or altering the file. So it's not really recommended, but just make a backup of your backup too, let's say. Um, but there is also a, an alternative, um, which is not an external tool, but a part of Kubernetes itself. It's called Volume Snapshot. And Volume Snapshot is uh, a new resource in Kubernetes, um, but it was introduced recently and it's now um, supported, but, but technically, um, it's really new and it requires not just a new Kubernetes version, but also a supported CSI driver version for infrastructure. So uh, the infrastructure provider has to implement the support for volume snapshot uh, in the CSI driver for that infrastructure provider, for the cloud provider. And then, uh, uh, and only then the volume snapshot is going to work. But if you are able to run the volume snapshots, uh, it's a great solution because it's native. It's supported by, uh, natively by Kubernetes. It's easy to configure. You can configure uh, the, the backups um, as a part of your cluster configuration. Um, and it's natively supported by the CSI driver. So there is no external tool for monitoring like Valero to make sure it works. So if, if it works, it's uh, controlled by the Kubernetes. And to finish the security part, there is one more tool that I wanted to talk about. And this tool is an open policy agent. Um, what is open policy agent? It is a tool which uh, supports the, uh, maybe let's say it a different way. Open policy agent is a tool which extends the role-based access control abilities. Uh, with role-based access control, you are able to configure for a specific user or group of user what they can do. And anything you don't configure is just denied. So this is only, it's kind of a whitelisting way of configuring the security and only based on uh, raw resources of Kubernetes. So you can say the user is able to create a deployment, the user is able to create a pod, the user is able to delete or update the ingress, um, but you are not able to say user is able to create a deployment which only contains a single pod. So this is not possible with, uh, with Airbag, but this is possible with the open policy agent and the gatekeeper tool, which is used by it. And what the uh, open policy agent or OPA does, it provides a system, a component, which can verify the policies written in the Rigo language um, versus the JSON documents. And uh, th this tool is uh, configured through web, you can configure uh, the open policy uh, agent or gatekeeper as an admission webhook in Kubernetes. And then each change to the cluster is sent to OPA and uh, to, to be verified if it should be accepted or denied. Um, so for example, 
you can configure or create a policy in Open Policy Agent Service uh, using the regular language to say, for example, you're only allowed uh, to, to create and deployment a pod using our container registry. So you have, for example, Artifactory installed locally uh, in your network, and you don't want people to use the containers coming from the internet because sometimes the, the internet connection is required. Uh, and you, there is always a possibility to use a firewall to limit this kind of behavior. Uh, but with the open policy agent, you can just say the only allowed um, container registry is, uh, is uh, our artifactory using uh, the regex versus the image name. And this would work great. And it also allows you to only limit the, this behavior to either specific namespace or specific uh, set of namespaces. So for example, you might want to have a space uh, where you need to uh, make some experiments, which might require access to a different repository, external one or just different one. Uh, and then you can just say, okay, this open policy agent uh, is checking the namespace too. In, inside the policy and verifies that. Or you can just uh, annotate the namespace to make sure that uh, it's not being uh, taken care of by the open policy agent. So for our, all more sophisticated policies or, or more sophisticated security, uh, the OP OPA is a very great tool uh, to expand what you can do with airbag and make sure that um, the actual behavior of people is more controlled than, than, than what you can do just with the airbag and firewall rules. Um, so that's, in the, that, uh, that's uh, all for that topic. Um, I hope you, you have learned something about uh, th those tools and you have seen that the open source may not seem uh, initially as a greatest solution, but it contains everything you need to create a working, reliable and secure uh, Kubernetes production ready cluster. Um, so that's it. Thank you and have a good day or have a good night. Bye.